What's up, girl? Good morning, Summer Church. Good morning, Summer Church. Good morning. Can y'all hear me in the back? Praise the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. We're going to start by doing our call to worship as we do every Sunday. So if you all would stand with me, um, if you're new here to Soma, welcome. My name is Tayshawn, and I serve here at Soma as the Director of Operations. And on this call to worship, as we will do with the liturgy following, we will um, read the underlined text together, and I will lead by reading the plain text. If you don't have a worship guide, you can receive one in the back or over here to your right side. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who founded you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Let us worship God together by singing songs. Think you hold the reins? You hold the reins on the sun and moon Like horses driven by king You cover the mountains, the valleys below With the breath of your mind the Treasures of wisdom, things to be known it is in this fortunate turn of events you ask me to be your friend you ask me to be your friend and you you are my first you are my last, you are my future, and my past. And you, you are my first, you are my last, you are my And you, you are my 
my first, you are my last, you are my future and my past. the beginning and the end so you are the beginning and the end yeah the beginning because you are the beginning and the the beginning and the end. You are my future. And you, you are my first. You are my last. You are my future and my past. And you my first you are my last you are my future and my Now is our time for um, confession. Two weeks ago, we did something more unique to Soma where we took time to look to the person to the left or the right of us and took time to confess one to another um, for whatever, things small or great, whatever is in your comfortable zone. Uh, I'm not asking for us to share our deepest, darkest secret, but share what the Lord puts on your heart to share. And uh, yeah, there's freedom in sharing um, our sins with one another and confessing with one another. Um, I myself, I want us to like rest in these moments, not feel judged, not feel like we're by ourselves. Um, each and every week, I have things that I have to confess for. I told my wife this week, if I can just obey one verse in Colossians 3, I think I'll be, I'll be all right. It's like I can't obey just one with any type of consistency. Um, and so there's always things for all of us conf to confess. Um, and so as we did before, we're going to read... Um, the underlying portion together, I'll read the plain text, and then after we'll take one moment um, to confess to our neighbor, um, whoever's closest to you, um, whatever you're comfortable with, and then we'll um, get back to our, our next song. So let us, let us read. I, Paul, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Lord, forgive us our pride, harshness, impatience, quickness to break with one another, and lack of unity in the spirit. Let us take time to confess to one another and then confess privately, and then we'll get to our song.
Sing before I spoke a word. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. If I took a breath, you breathed your life into me. You have been so, so good to me. love God oh it chases me down fight still I'm found leaves and nine denied I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it still you give yourself away oh be overwhelming never and this love of God When I was your foe When I was your foe Still your love fought for me You have been so, so good to me And I felt the worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, be overwhelming, never and in reckless love, oh God. Oh, it chases me down. Fight till I'm found Leaves the nine to nine I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, be overwhelming Never and in reckless love God No shadow, no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear it down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, Coming after me. No, why you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. No shadow. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me.
received his blessing of assurance. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Now is the time where we can dismiss our Soma kids. Um, we have infants on the inside and then um, all the other kids on the outside. So now is a good time to dismiss our Soma kids. And while you guys do that, we will continue um, worshiping God in song. I was an awful lost at the fall Running away, I'd hear you call Father, you were pure I had no righteousness of my own I had no right to draw near your throne Father, you love me still And in love before you laid the world's foundation you predestined to endow me as your own You have raised me up so high above my station I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone You left your home to seek out the lost You knew the great terrible cost Jesus, your face was set I worked my fingers down to the bone Nothing I did could ever atone Jesus, you paid my debt By your blood I have redemption and salvation Lord, you died that I might reap when you have sown And you rose that I might be a new creation I am born again by grace and grace alone I was in darkness all of my life I never knew the day from the night Spirit, you made me see I swore I knew the way on my own Head full of rocks, a heart made of stone Spirit, you moved in me at his touch, and at you touch, my sleeping spirit was awakened. All my dark and heart, the light of Christ is sure. Called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Heaven said it's sent by grace and grace alone. So I stand in faith by grace and grace alone. I will run the race by grace and grace alone. I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone. I will reach the end by grace and grace alone. Yeah. 
Well, we don't like the voice that says, wait, now's not the time, and to be preparing yourself. Uh, we live in a, hey, let's enter in and figure out what we don't know and build the plane while we're flying. Uh, fail forward and learn by doing, which actually I think is not opposed to a spirit that might at times, particularly spirit from the Lord, say, hey, wait and prepare. In fact, fail by doing where you're at before I send you out somewhere else. I mean, we like the, uh, you know, we're like the superhero, the Spider-Man is like, man, put me in the game. But ultimately, every Spider-Man or uh, superhero origin story tells us at the beginning, you need someone to come along, you need training, you need preparation, you need seasoning. Typically, it's Liam Neeson uh, who's going to do it, but... Uh, whether you're Obi-Wan or Batman or uh, the kids from Narnia, I mean, you need a little Liam Neeson in your life, but either way. We've been in the book of Acts, and we're in Acts 13, 1 through 4 today. And up until now, the first chapter of the book, Jesus promised something that has not yet come to pass, which is that he said, hey, I'm going to send you. You are going to be my presence. You are going to have my spirit fall upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And Acts, a lot of times in church, just culture, is known as like the global missions book. It's the sending out book. It's the Paul going across and taking a small faith from a group of people in a small upper room to going out from Jerusalem Samaria, and then eventually around to the entire known Roman world at the time. But again, up until now, we haven't been there. We've been Acts 1 through 12 in the preparation and the seasoning of the church. But today, we actually see the moment where the Spirit of God is going to say, hey, we are ready, and I'm going to put you in the game, and I'm taking Paul and Barnabas, and I'm sending them out to now do the whole ends of the earth thing that I promised. You guys have been prepared, which stands to reason to question what has, in this case, not the church in Jerusalem, but the church of Antioch, which will become the sending church for Paul's missionary journeys. What have we seen and learned about the church of Antioch to say, hey, you're finally ready for the big calling that I have for you? And that's important to ask because, A, I mean, we want to ask that regularly as a church. We want to be a church that follows in the pattern of Antioch and is, is a part of building what, King, the, what God is doing not only on the Near East side of downtown Indianapolis, but also in, in every corner of the earth and globe. But then also it's important to ask because it's, it, it's important on an individual level. A lot of you or, and myself in different times have come to God asking, hey, is this a time and a season to which I have been called? And sometimes I am struggling to hear his voice, and then I may look back at what we're going to look at today in the church of Antioch and say, but have I been doing these things which he prepared this church to do his calling in my own life? And so it's a question of, hey, if you're wondering, are you been, have you been called? The question might be first, have you experienced the same kind of preparation they've experienced in Antioch? And that's what we want to look at today, is what have we already observed with the Antioch church that brought them to this moment where all of a sudden God says, it's go time, let's get in the game. And then we can apply that, I think, both as a church as well as individuals. And we talk about it so much that God's calling in your life, I have to say almost every time, most people always think of like these big crazy moments of when he calls you to something really large, when reality, I mean, if you read all the will of God passages for your life, it's almost always dealing with the small, simple, being in community, bearing burdens, being grateful, being prayerful, being consistent. It's the 99.9% of your decisions which constitute God's will for your life, not necessarily the 0.01, but the 0.01 do happen. And we do have a lot of focus on them, and for you who are like, yeah, but I want to know when do I feel like God has prepared me for whatever he's called me to in my life. I'd refer back to the book of Acts, looking at the, at the people of Antioch. So first, the church of Antioch, I should say. Let's first read the passage for today. It was 13, 1 through 4. It says, Now there were in the church of Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menian, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, that's Herod of Antipas from last week, and Saul, 
while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So we can look at that moment and be like, okay, you just need to be worshiping and praying and fasting and the Spirit's going to come to you. But again, we have to then say, well, but we've been reading about the Antioch church for a while. And so what led them to this point? And the first place to go back to is where we were a couple of weeks ago in chapter 11, verse 19. I think there's four, uh, I don't know if you want to call them checkpoints or markings of a church or individuals that God is, has prepared, has gone through the Liam Neeson moment of preparing them to send out. But I would say that these are fairly good ones. First, uh, Acts 11, 19. Now those who were being scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. So I pointed this out a couple weeks ago when we talked through this passage, but it's also a place I want to start again for this morning, is that when Barnabas shows up to the church in Antioch, it says he saw the grace of God, which we asked a couple weeks ago, like, how do you see the grace of God? Because it's mainly an intangible, uh, uh, ethereal term. And the reality is that what we talked about then and what you probably know in your life as well is you see the grace of God working in your life and other lives when you see them starting to work out the teachings of Jesus and the life of Jesus and they begin being formed into the image of Jesus, not as individuals, though that is true, but as a overall community. And so you start seeing the Acts 2 and the Acts 4 of people being together and being in each other's homes and sharing, breaking bread together, sharing meals together, and and seeing, hey, there's some needs here that I can meet, and that is the concept of bearing burdens of one another. And so the first thing you see Antioch just naturally begin to live into is that they begin to take care of their own and grow into the image of Jesus as a community, as a people. We often think of our global missions as like, I need to be sent out. But the first thing that you see of Antioch is that they see themselves very much so committed and sent to one another. We have to be grown in this. And as we said a couple weeks ago, we already have so many of us that I see doing this. And this is simply something that is the ABCs of Christianity. The one anothering never leaves us. We only grow deeper in it over time. We reject a sense of individualism, which says you make your living, you carve out maybe your family or your relationships and your sphere of influence, and then you have your time and your space and your resources to yourself, which is completely foreign to the scriptures and the concept of being a people that are imaged in Jesus, is that you see yourself as we are all in God's creation, all in his image. And to the question that Cain asks of God when says, where's Abel, your brother? He says, am I my brother's keeper? And the answer overwhelmingly through the scriptures is, yes, you are. And so we start thinking about how do we rearrange our schedules as to not isolate ourselves, but to be in community with each other, not just on Sundays or Wednesday night or whenever your MC meets, but also in the warp and woof of your life. As elders this year, we got away in November just to talk about, hey, like, what do we see ourselves, like, what mission do we see ourselves as the church living out as Soma Downtown Church? And we came up with this language. We said, a Christ-led family being formed into the image of Jesus in community to build God's kingdom in our community. The church is nothing if it's not a family. If we're just coming here and gathering once a week or a couple times a week, yeah, that's great to kind of check a box of some cultural, like, level of expectation, but it's completely a useless part of your life. 
And so we try to do all that we do to gear our church and our lives to be focused in on how do we be a family? How do we form ourselves into the image of Jesus in community, by community, for the fact of building the kingdom in our community? I'll say a couple things to that. First is this. We as a culture hate being needy. I will say this. I like being the person who fills needs. I hate being the one who has need. But here's the reality that I think is God intended. There will always be seasons where you are the needy person. And maybe some of the ways that we have to grow in this over time is not just always being the ones who show up and meet needs, but also being the ones who are vulnerable enough to confess that I'm the one who has need in the season. So that brothers and sisters can come around and know and meet needs. And then, yes, the ones to the left and the right of you, overall, overwhelmingly in your season of just your life, comparison of like how much you are going to be the one in need to the, how much another person is going to be in need, it is going to be heavily outweighed towards serving and bearing other people's burdens just by the nature of community. However, there'll be always seasons that come for you, always seasons that come for you, where you, if are not in community, you'll probably figure out a way to get through it with some level of high-functioning addictive behavior or something like that. Just, I mean, you'll figure out a way to kind of sever off a part of your soul to make it happen. But that's exactly where you'll be at the other side of it, is less than human, less than what God has called us to be, which is a group of people that are highly needy and vulnerable, but yet together, there's no one in need amongst us. Again, this is something I think we're increasingly getting better at doing, and I see so much of. And so this, again, is probably not something that we're just saying, like, hey, what the heck? Like, how are we not doing this in our lives? No, this is something that we see and say, thank God, I'm seeing the grace of God in our church. I'm unsatisfied with the current amount, and I want more. And that's probably that true reality that, continue puts, that puts something out in front of us to continue to grow in deeper Christ-likeness. It, it stands to reason that as a church that is what I have sometimes jokingly called the millennial falcon, uh, is going to be deeper and deeper into the image of Jesus as we age into 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. And we will be better at bearing burdens. And yes, I know some of you are like, man, I'm here for two years on a residency. Thank God. We see that as a feature, not a bug. So we would love you to be a part of this community and then send you out to be a part of another community like this wherever you're going. But for those of us who God gives us a decade or two or three together, then we want to always be increasing in the grace of God being poured out through each other as a family. And then also, as we see that happen, I mean, that's when you start to see what we've already started to see, which is grace pouring out of our lives and out of the fact that we are cared for. Then you create people that are life-giving people that then start pouring that grace outward of the community, and you start to see people get involved in, and poverty on the Near East Side and, and uh, things like in Section 8 housing and, and in Inglewood Community Center and in Westminster, uh, people that have been involved in and, and Like a Lion and Naptown Young Life and in all ways that people are building relationships for the kingdom of God to intentionally be in relationship with people so that they can bear burdens, restore them into grace and walk alongside and disciple them into the image of Jesus together. Secondly, in this passage, we actually already covered it in the first half of those verses, but I'll read it again. It says, 19, Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. So what's the first checkpoint of a church that is going to be sent on God's larger mission and building something that is even bigger than they thought they could do is someone who, a church that has learned how to take care of each other's needs and bear burdens. And secondly, they're a church that begins to cross lines on, and make relationships across 
lines of ethnicity and background, across lines of socioeconomic class, across lines of worldview. That to fulfill any calling in the kingdom of God, any calling, we must be increasingly growing in our ability to be the ones who cross over lines and build relationships first. I see it as one of my primary callings. I've learned in ministry. Here's what you learn if you do it for a few years. One of the biggest skills to ministry is this. It's if you could call it a skill. Maybe just a willingness. A willingness to be the one who crosses over and takes the risk of rejection first. I mean, that's true on the large levels of uh, or I should say even micro levels of like, I, I'm officiating a wedding later today. Or later day, I was at a, uh, a rehearsal yesterday. And uh, weddings are always interesting environments because it's like all these like circles of people's lives coming and sometimes meeting each other for the first time. And you've got two different families. And there's like that time where like, you know, like things are set up and like people are just like waiting in their cars to wait for like, see who's the person who goes out first. And I just know like as the officiant, like one of your callings is just to go out there and be one of the first ones to be a stable presence for the bride and the groom, to risk the awkward conversation and to make the introduction time and time again. And this is something that I've learned to not only do on that venue, but also learning to do when you show up in hospitals. You show up being like, I mean, there's so many times where people are like, man, I, I, I don't know how if I showed up when somebody's like in a tragic moment or somebody's like having like a crisis of sin, like what would I show up and say? The call to ministry is to show up when you have no clue what you're going to say or do. But simply just show up. I have no clue what I'm saying or doing 90% of the time. Including this moment. And I just have learned like ministry is not to the cleverest or the wittiest or the most socially co comfortable or put together. It's simply to the ones who's willing just to show up and cross the line, to risk the rejection, to get to know somebody on their terms, to show up with a thousand questions. I show up and I often on Sunday mornings, I will connect with you. I don't expect to be asked one question. I expect to ask a thousand questions. Yes, I would love for people to, to know and get to know me, and there's context and, and avenues that that happens, and I'm not against people asking me questions. I just know often when I am going to extend myself, I'm going to find out and I'm going to bridge the gap by I want to know you. I want to learn about you. I'll reciprocate, I'll be vulnerable, I'll share. But sometimes you show up, you ask like one question, and they're like, well, they didn't ask me a question, and so the conversation stalled. I show up with 10,000 questions. I can be more curious than that. I don't say this, by the way, as someone who like sticks the landing with non-awkward situations or is not socially anxious. I am. You get used to making awkward situations. It's a skill. Maybe that's the skill, if any. It's just getting used to the cold water of that pool and being able to swim regardless of if you are smooth, together, clever, witty, or something far less than that. And sometimes those are the situations where I disarm that person much more because I'm not all put together, and so they feel free to not be as well. So you see Antioch there learning to take care of each other, learning to bear each other's burdens and to be a family together. And then they're learning to cross lines. They're starting to preach the gospel to the Hellenists and they start to see it move out amongst them. And then thirdly, and let's pick it up in 27, chapter 11 still. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit, that there would be a great famine over all the world. And this took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined, everyone according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. What's the third marking of a church that is sent, particularly sent out of their context, is one that is already beginning to view the larger church out of their context as their brothers and sisters. 
I mean, in this time, your family was everything. You took care of your family, which was why it was extremely radical to all of a sudden seeing a group of people in Acts 2 and 4 that began to treat each other like family even though they did not have common households. That was why the church was the one who led out and taking care of widows who were rejected and left to die, orphans who had no ability to raise up in society, to the, the, the sojourner and stranger, the outsider who comes in, because they were regularly making family out of anyone. Anyone can be a part of our family. And so then it stands to reason that they find out, hey, there's going to be a famine, and it's going to affect the Jerusalem church in a big way, the prophets say. Well, let's look at our resources as more than just our own, and let's say, hey, they're family too. I mean, that's the way that we want to regularly treat our resources, our time, and our energy. The last couple of years, I've started a lot of times having meetings and with people or churches or things that have, will have no benefit to our church and shepherding people that maybe are not even that connected or not connected at all. And yes, I have to reserve so much of my time to make sure that I, I can be connected to the life of our members and our regular attenders. But there's also a sense that, man, if, there's a, if I have an opportunity to step in and to encourage and to shepherd someone, I started just taking the policy a couple years ago, like, I'm just going to scatter the seed of the kingdom widely and trust that God will take care of our church. And that's true not just with time and energy. I mean, man, this week alone, actually, there was like, I spent several hours, actually multiple of our pastors uh, from across congregations, spent several hours uh, in person uh, relation, uh, like meetings and in phone conversations with another church that is not in this city. And helping them walk through a very difficult situation in their, the life of their church. It took a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of prayer. Not one of it was wasted just because it will never directly benefit the name of Soma Downtown Church. Because here's the reality. I could care less about the name of Soma Downtown Church. I mean, I care about it in the sense that it represents a people of, that I, I love and that a group of people that I see doing things intentionally on mission and we just need to have an organizing name that we, you know, identify as. But if it folds tomorrow, then I will still be in relationship, shepherding and caring and bearing the burdens of pretty much the, probably the same people doing much of the same mission. And if that means that we all have to figure out some other organization to be a part of or we just have to figure out another name eventually to organize around and call that, then that's fine because ultimately I am not greatly concerned about anything having our name on it because it's just a vehicle for the church to be a part of. And it's important, I think, that we remind ourselves of that in this season. Because, thank God, I mean, I, we haven't recognized this today, though we are recognizing this in huge ways. We've met our first phase goal of $100,000 for our building at 445 North State to put down our down payment. I mean, that's a huge thing. I mean, that's really, like, all, like, organizational, like, just benchmarks say that a church of our size, of our age, with our budget, would at the top level, everybody working, everybody like us, like the staff and the <laughs> leadership, like working overtime to, uh, oh man, I'm going to get a frog, here we go. <coughs> Doesn't get much more sexy than that. Um, either way, uh, all of us working completely overtime to like get the budget going. Uh, like we should, or to get a campaign going, we should at our top level be able to raise $100,000. We have already exceeded it without nearly that amount of time and effort that, that people say that a benchmark of our church size and organization should be able to do. And, and so God has been blessed, has been blessing us. And here's the reality too. There's still going to be need. I mean, we presented to the members a couple weeks ago. It's not just like we raised the $100,000 and now the building is just like, you know, an effortless uh, just thing to maintain over the next several years. It's a 100-year-old building. Oh, thank you, Allie. That's yeah, bearing a burden right there. Um, it's not like that goes away because the reality is, is now we have a 100-year-old money pit, that it's our money pit for the rest of our lives. Uh, not yet. We haven't closed on it yet, but praise God, we're praying to close on a money pit. 
And so we projected, like, we're going to need to increase our budget by $70,000 from this year to the coming year. That's like a 26% increase. That's serious. And we have the funds to be able to miss that for, you know, a little bit as we step up into it. But we have to look at ourselves and be like, hey, there's nobody from the outside coming to save us. We do need to step into this over time with generosity. But at the same time, we cannot forget, like, that the reason we're trying to funnel resources into being able to purchase a building is so that that building can be a pillar for the community to be able to meet needs and to be affecting people's lives and then send people out of our church to other places in the world. And so we can't be so focused. Yes, there is a time and a place that we need to meet needs of our church and we should do that, but we should always have a bent towards generosity outside of ourselves. And so this is a great time to remind ourselves in the midst of, yeah, we're going to probably continue to need to ask to like step up giving, do things that just to meet our needs internally. But yet at the same time, I want to be a person in a heart that is then not even, not slowing down completely to give to something completely outside of the name of Soma Downtown Church. Because again, Soma Downtown Church is a 501c3 that will, it was born and someday will die. But the church and the souls of the men and women that have been built together as a family for the kingdom of God is something that is eternal and is something that far expands just this area or this group or these relationships. But it's a brotherhood and a sisterhood across the globe. And so we begin sending and we continue sending, even in generosity to meet our own needs, we continue to say, but how do we not slow down in generosity towards the church and and giving? And as an organization, we continue to give towards the Harbor Network, formerly the Sojourn Network, to plant churches uh, across the country. And there's other ways that we attempt to try to give outside of ourselves. Lastly, the last marking. Back to 13, 1 through 4. You see it here. Now they were in the church of Antioch, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius and Cyrene, Manian, a lifelong friend of Herod, the Tetrarch of Saul, and Saul, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work of which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. The last marking that you see of a church that is going to be called probably most likely to do something in building the kingdom of a context outside of themselves is you see diverse leadership using their gifts to build up the body. I mean, you see laid out here, we have... Barnabas, who is a Jew. Simeon, who is called Niger, most likely of Africa. Lucius of Cyrene, which is also in, in uh, northern Africa. Manian, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. That is a, uh, a Gentile, like, uh, somebody who, or if a Jew, was, uh, lived in a, and grew up in a Gentile context, serving, uh, serving the uh, Roman leader at the time. And Saul, also a Jewish Pharisee. And so you have Jews, Africans, you have people that are involved in Roman Hellenistic culture, those who are involved in Jewish Pharisaical culture, all using, it says, prophets and teachers. The way that that sentence is constructed in the original language says that most likely the first couple are prophets and the last couple are teachers. And so they're a diverse leadership from different backgrounds, ethnicities, using their gifts to build up the body. And this is why we continue to say we want to be a church that looks like our neighborhood, which is a diverse neighborhood. Because if the image of God has been given to you, there's parts of the image of God that we will not see unless we have you working out and building your gift and building up the church. But it also stands to reason that if there's an image of God that is more imaged in a person, uh, a, a black person, a Latino person, a man or woman in our culture, then that means that we need all of those people in our body using their gifts to build up the body. In order to be the fullness of the image of God, we need to be the fullness of the humanity of who he has imaged us to be. And so it's why we are continually not ever going to give up on a goal, whether it is cool or not, whether it is politically left or right, whether it is something that is, you see as helpful or beneficial, it is speeding us up or slowing us down. We recognize that it's probably very much so something that slows us down, but regardless, we find it to be important to be the church 
of diverse leadership using their gifts to build up the body. And there's parts of the image of God that we just feel we will always be lacking until we continually move towards that goal. And so ultimately you see those checkpoints. You see a church of, who has learned to be a family and to take care of the needs amongst them, has learned to cross lines and has practiced the idea of crossing over lines in order to make relationships and build a kingdom. You see one that as continually seeing the church all around the globe as the church that they are responsible for. And then you see diverse leadership, diverse men and women using their gifts to build up the body, spiritual mothers and fathers shepherding the body. And so when we look at like, hey, when are we called? Like, how are we setting up our global missions program? Everything we do at Soma Downtown Church is our global missions program. Everything we do. I mean, that includes bringing meals to families who are in need, either maybe from a baby or from a sickness or from some sort of tragedy or good thing that's happened in their life, and you're sitting there meeting needs by bringing meals, helping that family adjust. That's part of global missions program. Sitting down across from someone and encouraging them when they're struggling and praying for them is a part of our global missions program. Doing tangible acts of love for people in our church. Like love not as a sense of I feel warm things about you, but that I show up even when I don't want to to meet needs for you. As a part of our global missions program. Evolving ourselves in racial reconciliation, intentionally figuring out ways that we can become a more diverse church by making relationships with our neighbors and inviting them into the family and meeting needs and extending ourselves. Doing walk the block. Dramatic pause. Doing walk the block as Tayshawn is leading regularly on a monthly basis of just walking around, meeting our neighbors, engaging in conversation to spread the good news of the kingdom of God and the gospel and to make relationships and to remember that person next time you see them and to ask about what you prayed, about, prayed for them for. That's a part of our global missions program. Because maybe we believe, I guess is the best way to say it, we believe as we do all those things, the Spirit of God is going to fall and to get, call us to even larger things. And so maybe some of you are going to be called to Africa, to Asia, to South America, to Europe, to some part of the world. But maybe some of you are going to participate in global missions by participating in Indianapolis, which is very much so a part of the globe. Maybe some of our sons and daughters are going to be called. And we are continually growing and preparing ourselves for God to call us into deeper relationships with opportunities to participate in things across the globe that will eventually be sending them. And so the way to conclude this morning as we ask ourselves is just asking, what, how are you participating in our global missions program? Which is to say, how are you participating in building us into the image of God? How are you participating in building the kingdom in our city? The model I like to think of when I think of the church was um, not developed by me, but uh, a lot of times when people think of an organization, you make like an organizational tree, right? Like you have like the leadership and that branches down to a sub-leadership and sub-leadership and sub-leadership and eventually you get the lemmings and the minions. Uh, and, and then people have like tried all things to like make it horizontal or make it, you know, upside down or do all these different things with it. Uh, I think the church is not best imaged by a tree, but by a tornado. Uh, and it's like this. Here's how tornadoes form. It's interesting. Tornadoes uh, don't form an overly logical or, or organized way. But what happens is you get a little bit of a wind current going one direction, meeting another wind current going another direction, meeting yet a third and a fourth and a fifth, and they all start colliding. But as they collide together, they eventually start to work in synergy around a common funnel or the common eye. And the person who was laying this out, he said, like, what if the church was like that? It wasn't like the top, like, dropping down ministry opportunities for those on lower, lower rungs of the tree branches. But it was people being filled with the Spirit of God 
using their gifts to build up the kingdom and build the kingdom in the city and just shooting off in a direction, meeting the energy of somebody who also filled with the image of, or the spirit of God, wanting to use their gifts to build into the family and build into the kingdom in the city, start shooting off in a different direction, but yet somehow a third direction starts to come together and you start to see slowly but surely these different callings on our lives, not waiting for like some like Soma Downtown branded event, but just showing up and doing these things day in and day out, start to form together in a synergy and start to move around the centralized eye of the storm, which becomes building his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. As a family, shaping into the image of Jesus in our communities to build the kingdom for our community. And so we talk with several of you. I talk with several of you. The other elders, the other leaders, the other MC leaders I know talk with several of you that are already not sitting around and waiting for like, man, when's the next branded event coming along? Because at the end of the day, I ultimately maybe will do a couple of those, but I'm not too interested in building those because I, we talk with you and we already hear about what you're doing to build up the family and to build the kingdom in our city or somewhere outside of our city. And so we want to simply just like, cheer you on and encourage you and say go and allow us to yes maybe it looks less organized in the formation but eventually form together and all the things god has called us to do and that again i say this and repeat that's already happening and so in a lot of ways we don't come here saying like hey how dare us how that we not do this and we say hey this is beautiful that we already see the grace of god working itself out in our church so let's spin a little faster. Let's add a little bit more wind to the current. Let's continue to work out these callings and the spirit of God we believe will be faithful to call us into larger and more opportunities to build his kingdom. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I pray asking you for larger opportunities still than what we've seen or to see the opportunities in which people are already involving themselves in organized and relational ministry across the city to grow into a deeper synergy of a tornado. But not a tornado ultimately bringing destruction, but one that gives life. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us to see our actions as what the church is doing in our city, as what our church is doing in our body. Some of downtown's church, or some of downtown church's actions happen through each and every person who calls themselves a member, an attender, a part of our family. And so, Lord, let that be um, continued because your spirit is leading us forward. And yes, we'll fail forward. Yes, we'll make mistakes. But at the same time, in that you're also, as we grow in these things, preparing us to be ready for even greater callings on our lives, on our lives of our children, or people after that, because your kingdom will not fail. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Satisfied her hunger was Billows calmed on raging seas With the souls of men she craved Sun and moon from balcony Turned their head in disbelief Precious love would taste the sting Disfigured and disdain Friday a thief On Sunday came Lay down in grief but I woke with the keys that day the firstborn of the slain and Jesus Christ laid death in his grave so three days 
So three days in darkness slept The morning sun of righteousness Rose to shame the throes and death The days rolled the moon Daughters and the sons of men The pain not their dues again The dead and blood they owed was rent For the day rolled the moon Friday you thief on Sunday king Lay down in grief But awoke with the keys Till on that day The firstborn of the slain The man Jesus Christ lay communion together to remind ourselves of the covenant that God has given us that we build a kingdom of grace and redemption that people that are not putting it all together and figuring out how to be built into ima God's image by our own acumen but actually those who have been redeemed by the body breaking and the blood shed of Jesus and I was inviting anyone into it no matter how jacked up they feel like they have made their lives that they can say hey there are those amongst us who have been redeemed still even from things like these and so let's take the body together take the bread which is Christ's body broken for you and then taking the cup this is Christ's blood poured out for you All right, now let's read together our giving liturgy. If you choose to give at some of downtown church, you can, uh, either for the building or for a general uh, budget uh, for, uh, at some of downtown church and following the prompts. Read this with me from Psalm 112, verse 5. Goodwill come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Let's sing together. <laughs> strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and soon. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all. Here in the flesh of Christ, I stand in Christ alone. Who took on flesh, from is a God in hell, this babe, this gift of love and righteousness. From the house of shout and soon till 
on the cross as Jesus died. The wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid. Here in the Christ I live. He lay, light of the world by darkness slain, and bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, as he stands, and as he stands. In victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I can this, and he is mine, while with the precious blood of Christ. Guilt, no guilt of life, no fear and death. This is the power of Christ in me. From my first breath to my own breath, Jesus commands my death to me. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever play. From his hand, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. He calls me home here in the power of Christ. I stand, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck. Me from his hand till he returns, calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I sin. Two quick things before our benediction. Uh, first of which is just going to start announcing this so you are constantly aware. July 4th is a Sunday this year. Uh, and we will be worshiping the Lord dispersed, not here. We will be having a renewal Sunday just to uh, care for, uh, give space for our, our volunteers and uh, those who serve here uh, on a regular basis on Sunday to uh, also be a part of just uh, worshiping and celebrating without serving in that day. So uh, as your fourth plans allow... Uh, we encourage you to gather together, to still gather together as the body in informal ways, uh, whether that be with an in, uh, just an individual, with another family, with your missional community. Uh, this is great ways just to consider how can we gather together uh, and be a part of even meeting in homes uh, on this Sunday. So uh, July 4th, uh, you uh, can show up here and use this space by yourself. Uh, and we bless that. Uh, this is a great place to gather if you want to. Uh, so either way, that is true. And then also... Because we are also celebrating the fact that we have met our $100,000 goal, we said, hey, how do we celebrate this well? We got cupcakes. So uh, at the Connect table, as you go, please uh, enjoy cupcakes. Stick around, enjoy, uh, break, uh, break sugary bread together. Uh, and so that is just a small way because we do really want to celebrate the fact that God has blessed us and he's blessed us tangibly through uh, this body uh, by giving sacrificially and generously in ways that, again, by all normal benchmarks, has out, uh, exceeded what uh, we should probably be able to do. Uh, so yes, there's still needs moving forward, but we also don't want to miss the opportunities to stop, uh, to, to thank God, to recognize what he's done, and to thank uh, the image of God and to, uh, to encourage the image of God in one another. So we're going to do that. Let me send you out. Uh, please grab a cupcake and then a benediction from John 1, 16. It says this, And from his fullness... We have all received grace upon grace.
Peace be with you.